Surely the presence of God is in this place. Amen. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. It seems that every time I read through scripture, I am surprised. Are you ever surprised uh, when you read a passage? I was at a Kairos prison ministry training event yesterday and one of the reflections that we had in a little one-on-one -on -one time that we were doing was about questions we had about scripture we have read. And we shared honestly, my friend and I, about things we read that we don't understand or things about our faith that we don't understand. And those are important discussions to have. Most often, I'm surprised by joy. As C.S. Lewis wrote, I am surprised by joy. I love to quote him. That is uh, my feeling when I read the living word of God. I'm surprised by the joy that floods my soul. Some surprises are welcome, but some raise questions. When reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the gospel accounts of Christ, I remember being surprised uh, when in the early going that they're not exactly the same. You can't lay Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John side by side and see an exact timeline just told in four different voices. Some stories are included in one and not in the other. And in our scripture for today, it appears in a different order than it appears in the other Gospels. The encounter that we're going to read today with the merchants and the money changers happens in the days before Christ's crucifixion in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it is actually used in those three Gospels as the reason why they want to put Christ on trial. It leads to his, his trial and his arrest. But in John's Gospel, it happens at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, right after the very first miracle that Jesus performs, where he turns the water into wine at the wedding in Cana. Uh, this placement, I think, reminds us that Jesus is concerned with our hearts, the state of our hearts in worship. He wants us to be focused on the real thing, on the risen Christ, experiencing the presence of the Lord in this place. I think that's why John places it where he does. And so we're going to read from John 2, 13 through 22 this morning. But first, let us pray. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to respond to your words spoken into our lives today. And all God's people said, Amen. So hear now the word of God from John 2, and I'll be reading verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? In other words, what right do you have to do this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I am surprised by the passionate nature of God's response, of Christ's actions in this passage. Are you a little surprised? I shouldn't be. I want to give you a little bit of a backdrop because uh, earlier in John's Gospel, Jesus is at a wedding where they run short of wine. Now, weddings in those days were a days-long affair. Uh, They went for several days. And they ran out of wine, and with a simple request from his mother, Jesus responds with surprising abundance, with surprising passion for his mother's request. He turns 140 gallons of water into wine, and not just any wine, into the very best wine. Just another example of how Christ wants the very best for us. Jesus is willing and able not only to meet our needs, but to supply more than we could ask or imagine. I think, and I I remember when I was a teenager, not really wanting to fully live into this gospel truth because I thought somehow my life would be less than. That I wouldn't get to experience all the good things everybody else got to experience. I'd heard about the parties. I wanted to be a part of the party. You know, and I think some people uh, resist fully surrendering to the will of Christ because they, they think it means that life will somehow be less than, that it will be watered down. But the miracle, this miracle that happens earlier in John's gospel of turning water into wine reminds us that as Jesus enriched the experience at the wedding in Cana, he can enrich our lives. That truly, when we are walking in the will of Christ, our life is more than we could have ever imagined. As one theologian writes, Jesus transforms drudgery and dreariness into the fullness of joy. And so I want us to take a closer look at this passage in light of that understanding. Have no doubt that those who witnessed Jesus turning over the tables in the temple, I know they must have been as surprised as we are. It surprises me every time I read it. Not not only that he would turn over the tables, but he would turn them over in the courts at a place of worship. His anger doesn't seem to fit. And then I remember what true love looks like. Walker, have your mom and dad ever had to correct you? Yes? Yes. I could ask the same question of all of you, right? Has your mom and dad ever had to correct you? And some of the lessons that I learned, some of those corrections early in life have stuck with me. And I still live by those corrections, those right teachings that my parents gave me. Sometimes love involves correction. John's Gospel says Jesus made a whip of cords and drove out the merchants and the money changers. And we wonder why. Because in those days, if you understood temple worship, you would know that the people had to bring animals for sacrifices. And sometimes the people who had come to the temple to worship, who came from other lands, did not have the correct currency. And so they had to have a money exchange, their money exchanged in order to buy the animal sacrifices. So this is actually a, a normal part of worship in that day. But there are a variety of theories then about why Jesus overturned the tables when they were doing things that were necessary for the worship in that day. Some scholars say Jesus doesn't want our churches to be turned into a den of thieves. In fact, that's the language used in one of the other Gospels. 
Others suggest Jesus is calling for a dismantling of the whole practice of animal sacrifice. We know now that you know, he's foreshadowing the fact that he is the ultimate sacrifice. But in John's gospel, I think there's something more. In a world where anything goes, we sometimes forget that God, who is a God of love, can be upset, can get angry. We do our best to look away from this passage because it can make us uncomfortable. Especially because we think of God as a God of love and for him to get angry in a place of worship seems out of place. So what are we to make of this passage? Well, as I stand before you today, I am here to affirm that God is a God of love. This is true. He is a God of love. But we must remember that God loves us enough to correct us. When we're headed on the wrong path, when we're bent on self-destruction, when we get our priorities out of whack, As one theologian writes, God is love and loves us enough to say that we will end up bankrupt if we co-opt everything for our own consumption. This, This morning's passage is a reminder to us that we'll be in bad shape if we just consume. All we do is consume. We want, we're bent on having more, of consuming more. John is teaching us that Jesus wants us to empty ourselves. He's concerned about our hearts, the state of our hearts in worship, about why we come to worship. Worship is not something we consume. It's something we come to experience, something that transforms us. So church, here's our question for this morning. What is the state of our heart in worship? Not only this morning, but every Sunday. There was a temptation then as there, as there is today for the focus to be on anything other than the worship of Christ. Here in this passage today, the focus may have been on the money and the, the consumerism And that may be what Christ was speaking against on that particular day. Whatever it is that interferes with the worship of God. And so in this surprising encounter, we're challenged on how we view our place of worship. It's not the building that we worship, as beautiful as the building is. It's the God who is present with us that we worship. Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Well, we know now with the benefit of history what he means. Those who were present then said, what are you talking about? It took us 46 years to get it to this point. And you're going to raise it up in three days? Those first hearers were Surprised by Jesus' words. They didn't understand, but we do. You see, the temple had always been the place where they had to come to be with God. It was where God and humanity came together in communion. In fact, there was a a place called the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum that very few went into. And it was the very presence of God in that place. But we know that on the day of Christ's crucifixion, that curtain that separated the people from the Holy of Holies was torn. The disciples, after the resurrection, remembered what Christ had said in this encounter. And finally, they understood Jesus is the new temple. 
and as sons and daughters of Christ, we carry the temple of Christ within us. As followers of Christ, we're called to be the dwelling place of God, for Christ to dwell richly within us. This passage reminds us that as we gather for worship on Sunday mornings in the modern-day temple, and as we gather in our churches, we're called to remember that what we do here matters. What happens here matters. As we recite the Apostles' Creed, the words of this historic confession of faith, we, we affirm what we believe. We're reminding ourselves of who God is and who God is to us. As we sing the hymns, as we hear the word of God proclaimed in song and message, we're called to be fully present to the risen Christ. So are we? Or are we distracted by that tea time we've got today at noon? or the reservations we've made at the restaurant, or the to-do list that waits for us, or an afternoon of shopping, or even that nap. What is the state of our heart in worship? Are we fully present to Christ's transforming work in this place, in our hearts and lives? Worship is intended to inform how we live out the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the world. Worship is meant to convict and to challenge us. It is meant to transform our hearts, to draw us back, our focus back to what matters most. And this can only happen when we're truly engaged in worship. Now you're here, either in person or those who are worshiping with us online, you get it. Praise be to God. I'm so glad you're here. But I wonder why our pews aren't full. Look around. We got some room here. We have more than 300 members on our roll. We're doing good if we get 100 of them on a Sunday morning. Now I recognize that some folks are homebound. And some are on the rolls because this is the church of their birth. They live elsewhere and they're unable to worship with us. But the empty seats raise a question about the importance or the lack of importance of worship in our lives today. I know after conversations with some folks, they feel like I do. I don't want to miss a Sunday. I want to be here every single Sunday to hear whatever the choir has prepared for us, to hear whatever Wayne has prepared or Jan or Susan to hear the people of God proclaim in the call to worship our love and adoration of the risen Christ, to pray the beautiful prayers. My heart is enriched and enlivened. I feel that God touches us here. This morning's passage reminds us that worship is about resurrection. Every Sunday is Easter Sunday. We celebrate the resurrected Christ. We're being raised up as we sing and we pray and we worship together. So church, are we in need of some spring cleaning? Do we have some tables that need overturning? some distractions that we need to get out of our lives so that we can focus on the risen Christ and what he's calling us to be and to do, to build his kingdom. 
As I was at my Kairos training event, I had one of the ladies uh, in another conversation we were having. She was talking about her walk to Emmaus, which is a three-day spiritual life retreat for those outside of the prison walls. It's the same thing Kairos is, but it's for people who are not incarcerated. And she said that when she, before she went to that three-day spiritual life retreat, before her heart was enlivened, that she thought it was enough just to be a good person. I could probably get an amen or two on that, right? We go through life and we think it's enough just to be a good person. And we are called to be good people. That is important. But what she realized and what changed her life forever, and I've experienced the same change, is, it, is it's not just what I believe, it's how I live what I believe. If I've been truly transformed, then it doesn't stay here in my prayer closet. It doesn't stay here in this sanctuary. I'm compelled by the love of Christ for me and my love for others to go out into the community, a community that needs to feel the love of Christ. How are we transforming this community with the love of Christ? So church, are we in need of some spring cleaning? there's something that we have made more important than the worship of Christ, that the love of Christ and living our beliefs, if there is, it's time to flip the tables on those distractions. This morning scripture reminds us to be alert to those distractions, to those things that pull us away from a closer relationship with Christ. If you're saying to yourself, you know, I have not been reading my Bible every day. Maybe it's time to make it a priority. Spend time with God and not only read it, which is wonderful, it is wonderful to read the living word of God, but react to it. If I truly believe this, how does my life change? What is God saying to me in this passage? This morning, scripture reminds us that worship is about resurrection. I love it when people come early and I can see them visibly bow their heads in prayer as they prepare their hearts for worship. This morning's scripture reminds us that Jesus is concerned with transforming our hearts and lives. And one of the ways he does that is through our worship of the risen Christ. May our worship be enriched by the reading and hearing of his word today. Amen.